Whoa, what is this? Looks like some sort of ape man. Your daddy, right? You're not my daddy. Hang on, folks, while I get this guy out of here. So that's where my hat went. I've been looking all over for that. Okay, <laughs> now I think we're ready. You mean, now that you got your costume on and you can pretend to be a field scientist? Just like that other creationist, Ian Juby, who wears that same costume? Or that other creationist, John Pendleton, who wears a lab coat? Also, you can fool the kids into thinking you have expertise on a subject you refuse to study. You all should go trick-or-treating together. I mean, to be fair, I've dressed like a paleontologist, too. That's because I was actually on a paleontological expedition. I wore a safari vest because I was literally on safari in South Africa. But is Mr. Dave Bisbee here doing any research in any field? Now, Dave, what, what is your background? Well, my background for the last 25 years, I've worked for an electric utility, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe it. That's the only thing Bisbee said so far that I do believe. So he's not a field scientist. He's an electrician who is just dressing up to pretend. I didn't know that today was a costume party. I guess I should go and get changed. Hello and welcome to The Zone. I'm your host, Big Wave Dave. So today we're going to talk about ape men. Were they real or just pretend? If the pretender can dress up, I can dress up. When Bisbee says ape men, he's referring to fossil hominins, what we used to call hominids until a couple decades ago, when comparative genomics forced a revision of the ape family tree. See, what happened was, back in the early 1700s, a century before Darwin, a botanist known as Carolus Linnaeus attempted to classify all plants and then all living things taxonomically. Because he was a pre-Darwinian Christian and a creationist, Linnaeus expected to see a collection of created kinds. But what he noticed instead was a branching tree pattern, wherein every species was closely associated with other species in a parent category, which he called a genus, and which was itself associated with other genera within a family, and that family with other families were also within a subset of ancestral classes, within orders, within phyla, narrowing to what he saw as two kingdoms. Now, of course, we understand this system to be much bigger and more complex than he could have imagined. The hierarchy he discovered implied the family tree, where everything was apparently related, and he couldn't explain that because he was a creationist. He believed that new species could only come about as an act of special creation by God, yet the evidence he saw implied common ancestry. And Darwin, of course, eventually solved this mystery when he showed that the origin of species was possible through natural selection. But Linnaeus had never heard that explanation. For him, this was always an inexplicable mystery that was especially problematic when it came to the apes, because he couldn't tell them apart from humans. Studying their physical characteristics, Linnaeus determined that humans were apes and that apes were people. Gorillas hadn't been discovered by science by that time, but he did know about chimpanzees and orangutans, and he classified both of them as different species of humans. Then he challenged the scientific community of his day, saying, I demand of you, and of the whole world, that you show me a generic character, one that is according to the generally accepted principles of classification, by which to distinguish between man and ape. I myself, most assuredly, know of none. I wish someone would indicate one to me. But if I had called man an ape, or vice versa, I would have fallen under the ban of all ecclesiastics. It may be that as a naturalist, I ought to have done so. Way back then, Carolus Linnaeus already knew that, morphologically, humans are the same thing as apes. So how did the scientific community respond to that challenge? Well, they were mostly creationists back then, too. And just like modern creationists, they couldn't address the actual facts of the matter. They couldn't even honestly acknowledge them, even. And having no legitimate reason to separate man from ape, but having to believe that apes and humans were different kinds, they contrived an artificial, arbitrary, and false distinction. They simply invented two categories, Pongo and Homo, classified as sister groups, where Pongo was paraphyletic, being all anthropoids except humans. Which is a bit of a Freudian slip, because if you say all of them except us, you are admitting that we are one of them. Now this wholly erroneous and dishonestly contrived classification persisted from the first half of the 18th century to almost the end of the 20th century during which time scientists discovered a whole lot more fossil ape species than we have alive today. And most people only know about gibbons, gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, and the old classification only pertained to these modern groups, not their ancestors. 
as if humans and apes had both evolved from something that was not an ape itself, but rather an ape-like creature. But there were now dozens more species in the fossil record that were not allowed to call apes, though that's obviously what they were. And some of them, like Dryopithecus, Artopithecus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, each of which is a genus of multiple species, were evidently bipedal, with some being closer to humans than chimpanzees, transcending the artificially derived boundary between humans and apes. Back then, these transitional forms were called hominids. Of course, religious apologists don't know anthropological terms like that, so they say ape men instead. However, the old erroneous segregation of Pongo and Homo into sister groups was finally refuted genetically. Numerous comparisons of the human chromosome with that of other primates confirms that humans are nested within the family of apes and that our species is one among them. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about coding DNA or endogenous retroviruses or even chromosomal variants because of the fusion of two of their chromosomes into one in us. Any way you look at it, our genetics confirm our ancestry among the apes just as surely as a genetic paternity test proves whether you're the father. So that by Y2K, taxonomists had already rejected the old paraphyletic ranks in exchange for a new system of monophyletic clades in which Pongo has been reduced to a genus that only includes orangutans and their fossil relatives, while humans are now universally accepted as hominids, one of several species of great apes in the taxonomic family Hominidae. There is no dispute in science that humans are apes, not just that we evolved from apes, but that we are still apes right now. My first class in anthropology a decade or so ago, we had a really old teacher who was still using that antiquated system for his test which asked us to distinguish between hominids and apes. But the new system reduces that question to nonsense. So I had to show him current corrections proving that hominids are apes, just like canids are dogs. So gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and humans are all hominids, and so are our fossil ancestors. Thus, there needed to be another distinction for the subset of apes that walked upright and were closer to the human form, because we know of a lot of those now, several species like that. So in the newly corrected construct, one subset of the family Hominidae is the tribe Hominini, and the members of that tribe are not just hominids, they are more specifically hominins. And not all of them were human, most of them were not. But that is what Bisbee means when he says ape men. Okay, let's start with what the Bible says. Why not start with the Rig Veda? That's older than any book of the Bible. Why not start with Homer's Odyssey or Hesiod's Theogony? Or, let's do the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Or, <laughs> the first edition of The Amazing Spider-Man. Here's an idea. Instead of a storybook, let's start with the facts. You know, things that are actually true. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he did all of that in just six days. Now, on the sixth day, God created the first humans, Adam and Eve. But you know, some people don't believe that. Most people don't believe that. Very few people do. Creationism is a tiny minority, even among Christians. And the entire Christian collective is a minority, too, on the global stage, because there's lots of conflicting myths from various religions made up by different cultures trying to explain what they obviously did not understand. Some people believe that humans evolved from ape-like creatures over millions of years. So which one is true? I mean, after all, if evolution is true, then your great-great-great-grandpa was a monkey. But don't worry, Grandpa's not a monkey. You'll see that when we're done with this lesson. No, when we're done with this lesson, you'll see that Grandpa was a monkey, and so are you. Remember that in the modern cladistic system, a monkey is any member of the taxonomic suborder Anthropoidea, also known as semiaforms. We have a long list of physical characteristics that identify us as unambiguous primates. And then we add to that even more traits to specify us as monkeys, and even more specific traits to further specify us as old world monkeys. And cladistically, apes are a subset of old world monkeys, and humans are a subset of apes. I'll put a link below for a detailed explanation that We're just fucking monkeys in shoes. But in the old Linnaean system, paraphyletic classifications were allowed. And just as humans were once considered different from apes, apes were once said to be different from monkeys. That old paraphyletic system is the one I grew up with. It was only corrected in the last 25 years or so. It's the one Bisbee is still using now because he's a quarter of a century out of date. Yet he's showing a chimpanzee 
and calling it a monkey. So I, as a child, would have laughed at him for making such a stupid mistake, even back then. We're comparing two taxonomic systems in which either a chimpanzee is not a monkey and neither are we, or if it is a monkey, then so are we. Bisbee got it wrong both ways, because creationism is always wrong all the time. Okay, let's start by playing a game, real or pretend. I'm going to show you some slides, and what I want you to do is you decide whether it's a real creature or is it pretend, and then shout out your answer. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Real or pretend? That one's real. Real or pretend? That one is pretend. All right, here's the next one. Real or pretend? If you said real, you got it. Okay, how about this one? Real or pretend? That one is pretend. Two more. Real or pretend? That one is real. So far, this sounds like pics or it didn't happen. That if there is actual photographic evidence, then it's real. But if it's a cartoon, like something we only see in books, or if we have to use our imagination to see it at all, then it's fake. That makes sense. What about this one? Are these real or pretend? I don't know. Some of you might be hesitating right now. I mean, these ape men, they, they look kind of real, don't they? Well, don't worry. They're pretend. And that's what we're going to talk about. No, transitional hominins are not just pretend. Science doesn't work on make-believe. Religion does. That's what faith is. You pretend that your Bible is true. You pretend there's a God, and you pretend that you have a soul that you pretend will live on after you die. None of that is evidently true, and the Bible is just flat-out false. All of that is pretend. But transitional hominins are not. But wait. Isn't evolution a proven scientific fact? I mean, we hear that on TV and, and all over the place. Yes, and I can prove that even to your satisfaction with a bit of Socratic interaction to correct your misinformation. But I note that believers tend to run from that challenge like cockroaches when the light comes on because you all don't care what the facts are, because you don't even want to know what the truth is. You'd rather make believe something else instead. In fact, some public schools teach that we evolved from ape-like creatures over millions of years. What about that? When the once entirely religious scientific community of the 1700s adopted a dishonestly contrived segregation of apes into Pongo and humans into Homo, that tradition stuck for like 250 years, being perpetrated even by predominantly atheist scientists later on, until it was finally proven false, which we should have known better all along. I mean, Linnaeus did. And having to view humans as a sister group to apes, with the ape classification being limited to modern species, meant that our ancestors could not be called apes no matter how ape-like they obviously were. It's surprising that it took so long to correct such an obvious error that was deceptively contrived in the first place. But that's why Bisbee says ape-like ancestors when really they and we were and are apes. You have to remember that there are two different types of science. Now, the first type of science is called observational science. So this is the type of science where we do experiments. You ever do experiments at home or in your class? They're kind of fun, right? So we come up with ideas and then we test them to see if our ideas are correct. So observational science is responsible for things like airplanes and cars and phones and medicine and all kinds of technology. But there is another type of science. The second type is called historical science. Now, in this type of science, what happens is that people dig up fossils like this one, and then they, they come up with ideas. But here's the thing. There's no way to test those ideas to see if they're correct. Of course there is. Historical science is exactly like empirical science. They are the same thing. Both start with observations leading to the formation of hypotheses, which can be tested by future discoveries or experiments. If you want to see how old it is, if you want to understand its taxonomic relationships, what sort of life it led and what it ate, how it reproduced, and many other aspects of its life, definitely can be tested to see if they're correct. But Bisbee wants to pretend that the Bible is true, and that means that he has to tell the kids that scientists don't really know what we really do know. You should be ashamed, Bisbee. And there's something else to think about. Your worldview what you think about God and the Bible and things like that have a big impact on how you interpret these fossils. 
What Bisbee is inadvertently admitting here is that if your worldview is dogmatic, religious extremist, reality denial, such that you have to find some excuse, any excuse, to rationalize or justify or otherwise dismiss any and all evidence against your preferred delusion, then you are biased, because religious faith is a bias by definition. But science has principles and practice designed to minimize or eliminate bias. Now, Bisbee has a belief system with required beliefs and prohibited beliefs, whereas science depends on free thought, allowing us to be honest with ourselves and follow the facts wherever they lead. For example, some people can look at the exact same bones and come up with two completely different ideas about what that animal was. Wrong again. For one thing, these are not completely different animals. They are essentially the same animal. It's just a matter of whether it walked upright or on all fours. Apparently, Bisbee thinks that if an ape always walks upright like we do, then it's human. In which case, here are a couple of small humans. Remember that there are and were apes that commonly walk upright just like we do. In this illustration, only one of those people is looking at the evidence at all. Noting, for example, that the foramen magnum, the hole where the spinal cord goes into the skull, is in the back on chimpanzees because they're habitual quadrupeds, not well adapted for walking upright whereas the hominin skull is balanced on top of where the spinal cord enters through the bottom because it's more comfortable and much more efficient for them to walk upright. That's just one of the many realities that the bibliolater has to ignore to pretend, yes pretend, that the hominin was just a quadruped. For shame, Bisbee. Misleading children with false claims like that. Okay, now whenever you hear that somebody has found an ape man, there are three questions that you should ask. The first is, what fossil did they actually find? You'd be amazed at what the pictures that they've drawn from just a little tiny fossil, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. The second question is, what is the worldview of the person who's telling you this information? Do they love God? Do they hate God? Do they believe the Bible? That sort of thing, because again, it's really important when we're dealing with historical science to know about the background of the person. Here is a short list of professional scientists who are Christian, who love God and the Bible, but they also accept the fact of evolution, and they don't lie to children trying to undermine science. If you read the Bible and just can't believe all the absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions therein, then you might still believe in a God, just a better version of God. But if you don't believe that there's a God at all, then how could you hate him? That doesn't make any sense. Bisbee, has no one ever corrected your fundamental mistakes here? You know, if you allowed comments on your videos, then you would know why everything you say here is wrong. But then, that's why you don't allow comments, isn't it? You already know it's wrong, but you want to believe it anyway. And finally, as Christians, how can we look at this through a biblical worldview? By ignoring or discounting all the evidence and by misrepresenting it as if it supports your religious bias specifically the fallacy of confirmation bias in this case. For example, the Bible clearly teaches that there were no pre-humans. No, it doesn't. In fact, many Christians have taken the interpretation that Cain found his wife in the land of Nod, a civilization inhabited by people who maybe pre-existed Adam and were not related to Adam. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, not from an ape. So that's just one more way to know that the Bible is wrong. Because Francis Collins, one of those professional scientists who is an evangelical Christian and loves God, explained in a couple of his books how we know that humans emerged from primate ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago from a population of something like 10,000 people, not just two individuals. He was a geneticist, director of the Human Genome Project, yet he said that Adam and Eve, as the literal first couple and the ancestors of all humans, simply do not fit the evidence, and that it is not possible to develop this level of variation from one or two ancestors. The Bible got a lot of things wrong, but if you believe in the Bible, then your mind is closed, such that you can never admit when it's wrong, no matter how obvious that is. That's why I say that faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. And some people are so determined to believe in their various holy books, even when they know that they're wrong, even when they have proof that it's wrong, they're still going to believe it anyway. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said 2 plus 2 equals five. I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. 
So looking at this from a biblical worldview means not only that you simply ignore all the evidence entirely, it means that you reject reason itself, since it is impossible to reason with someone who is determined to believe against all reason. Okay, time to get into the evidence. Are you ready? Let's go. Remember these guys? Let's start with Nebraska man. In 1922, scientists found a tooth. Just one tooth. And from that tooth, they made this. Mr. and Mrs. Nebraska Man. Aren't they lovely? And so this was the news was spread all over the place that they had found proof that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. About 10 years later, they went back to the same site to try to find more fossils. And they found one. They found a tooth that was identical to the first one. But this tooth was still attached to a jaw. The jaw of an extinct pig. So Nebraska man was actually a pig. No, I'm not being mean. It was really just a pig. That's not entirely accurate. Bisbee got almost all of that wrong. There was never any claim that Nebraska man was proof of human evolution. They didn't go back 10 years later and they didn't find an identical tooth either. What really happened was that Henry Fairfield Osborne found a tooth that was badly worn and the damage that it had made it look like a human tooth, which he took it to be. When he submitted that claim to peer review, the Illustrated London News got a hold of it and the magazine commissioned their own artist's impression. Popular press relies on sensationalism to sell newspapers, such that even if a discovery was predicted and expected, the news story will still say that it overturns everything and forces scientists to rethink their theories and similarly evocative headlines. Scientists of the day, including Osborne himself, immediately reacted with such harsh criticism that the article was never reprinted. Even when Osborne initially believed that his fossil was human, he criticized the illustration himself, calling it a figment of the imagination with no scientific value and undoubtedly inaccurate. Yet, creationists pretend that scientists came up with that image. More importantly, the entire scientific community rejected his claim. No one accepted it. At best, they told him that he would need a lot more evidence. But after five years of searching, he still couldn't find any, and he eventually realized that he had misidentified the tooth of an extinct peccary. Thus, Osborne was forced to publish an embarrassing admission of error along with a retraction. If only religious claims were held to such standards of accountability. If only believers were held accountable at all. Okay, so let's review where we're at. Nebraska man was a pig. Let's talk about Piltdown Man. Okay, so in 1912, scientists found some fossils. And from these fossils, once again, they announced, we have proof that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. They made pictures like this. They, they, post, they uh, put together textbooks, all kinds of different news that Darwin was right. But let's take a closer look. This is a replica of the Piltdown Man's skull. Now the areas in black here are the bones that they actually found. The white is a reconstruction. Now they were really excited about this. In fact, as I mentioned, they wrote textbooks like this one here. This is Piltdown Man on the cover, teaching all about how scientists have proof that we evolved from ape-like creatures. So they were going to make a national park and they were going to name it after Piltdown Man. So they said, you know what, let's take a look at the fossils one last time. Now when they did, they found something shocking. Piltdown Man was a fake. Somebody had taken the jaw of an ape and joined it with the skull cap of a human and then used tools on it and stained it to make it look like it was real. Do you know what that means? That means that people were taught a lie for over 40 years. Ouch! Could be worse. People have been teaching creationism for thousands of years. Piltdown Man wasn't found by scientists. Instead, it was presented by a lawyer working with a priest and possibly the author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, too. It was apparently intended as a prank with the motive being to humiliate the British Museum. Again, there was no claim that this was the proof that humans had evolved from apes. That fact had already been established by other discoveries in the tropics. The fact that Piltdown Man didn't match any of those other discoveries is the very thing that called it into question. Thus, it was deemed an irrelevant anomaly to be stored away and forgotten for 40 years until advances in technology allowed for better testing methods. 
All right, let's review. Nebraska man was a pig. Piltdown man was a fraud. A fraud perpetrated against evolutionary science and which was exposed by evolutionary scientists. If creationists knew how to expose a fraud, they wouldn't be creationists anymore. Let's take a look at Neanderthals. So this was one of the first skulls that they found. And from that skull, they hired somebody to make a picture that looked like this. Wow, that's really scary. Now since then, scientists have found all kinds and hundreds of different fossils and artifacts. We now know that Neanderthals, they made tools and then musical instruments and jewelry. They cooked, they buried their dead. And all the evidence shows that Neanderthals were not ape men they were fully human. Neanderthals were never supposed to be ape men, but rather a distinctly different lineage of humans. They and Denisovans were like the older brothers of Homo sapiens. While creationists tried to deny that, saying that the first Neanderthal fossils ever found were no more than an old man with rickets. But now that we've found hundreds of Neanderthal men, women, and children, apparently now the excuse is that they're not ape men, which they were never supposed to be in the first place. They were always known to be human, but what does fully human mean? Because we now know of several species that are only called human because they're members of the genus Homo, but none of them are fully what we are now. What about Homo longi, Naledi, Floresiensis, Erectus, Habilis, and so on? None of them are fully human, not what we would recognize today. Okay, let's review what we got. Nebraska man was a pig. Piltdown man was a fraud. Let's let God take care of this one. Neanderthals were fully human. Okay, so let's talk about the latest poster child, Artie. This is what they found. I, I don't know about you, but that kind of looks like E.T. or something like that. I mean, this is just what a mash of bones here, right? But that didn't stop them from doing this. They made all kinds of movies and posters and videos and pictures. They put it in textbooks. In fact, Artie is on display at the Museum of Natural History as one of our ancestors. But how could they get all that from, from this smashed up collection of bones here? Because the only thing that I see that is really kind of clear that we know anything about is Artie's feet and her hands. And here's what's interesting. Her feet and her hands are totally ape-like. So why would anybody claim that she's our ancestor? After all, these hands and feet are what apes use to climb in trees and to get into lots of trouble. Okay, so based upon those hands and feet and that they are indeed ape-like, Artie was nothing more than an extinct ape. I don't know what Bisbee expects here. Instead of dressing up like a researcher, he should have done at least a minute of actual research. But he didn't even bother to Google this before spreading his nonsense. It irritates me when someone tries to pass themselves off as a science educator and speaks authoritatively about science when they obviously don't have the first idea what they're even talking about, and they're only trying to undermine the exercise. The purpose of a science class and the goal of a science teacher should be to inspire curiosity in the student so that they'll want to find out more on their own and make their own discoveries and even question their own assumptions. But that is exactly the opposite of the goals of a religious apologist who only want to stifle curiosity to instead force conformity and instill unquestioning submission to authority. It's child abuse designed to stunt their intellectual development. Okay, let's review. Nebraska man was a pig. Piltdown Man was a fraud. Neanderthals were fully human. And Artie was nothing more than an extinct ape. Wrong. Even historical science makes predictions about how future experiments or discoveries may support or contradict a given hypothesis. And Artie fulfills one of those predictions. In this case, we were looking for a series of intermittent stages in the transition from the common concept of a chimpanzee to a human. And arguably the first of these steps would be an ape that is very like a chimp, 
even still living in the trees, but that also has an increased ability to walk and run on two legs while on the ground. And most importantly about Ardipithecus is the generalization of the teeth and the reduction of the canines, the first steps of what we would expect of a transition heading towards humans. Okay, let's finish our time together with Lucy. So the scientific name given to Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis. Wow, that's a big fancy name, right? Do you know what it means? Southern ape. So even the name, Lucy's name says she's an ape. So anyway, this is what they found originally. You can see not a whole lot there, but from that, they made all kinds of statues and they put them in museums and they made her look very human-like. But, but why? Well, let's look at a few facts about her. First of all, discovered in 1974, and as you can see, they only found 40% of her skeleton. A lot of it was missing. Now, since then, scientists have found more fossils, so they have a better idea of what Lucy's kind look like. And based upon those fossils, she looks like an ape. For example, her skull was sloped and ape-like. Her hands and fingers were curved and ape-like and designed for swinging in trees. Her wrist bones, well, they could lock into place for knuckle walking. Her toes were curved and ape-like. Everything about these fossils indicate that Lucy was nothing more than an extinct ape. False. But aimed that. You don't know what you're talking about. Without any relevant education whatsoever, Bisbee is now contradicting a consensus of experts in order to mislead children on a point where he is clearly wrong. Lucy was not a knuckle walker, but we will get into how we know that soon enough. Even some evolutionists say that she was not our ancestor. Understand that every fossil found is only an individual in a population, perhaps several closely related populations, and there is always variety at every stage. So paleontologists typically won't say that any particular species is the direct ancestor of any others because there's always a possibility that we might find something else even closer. Instead, they only talk about potential ancestors. The popular press, however, doesn't know any better and commonly does speak in these absolute and inappropriate terms, just like creationists do. By the way, if you want to learn a whole lot more about Lucy, check out our video, Was Lucy Really Our Ancestor? If you want to see Bisbee learn a whole lot more about Lucy, check out my rebuttal of that video in the next episode, because I'm about to school the boy. We're doing great one last time. You ready? Here we go. Nebraska man was a pig. Piltdown man was a fraud. Neanderthals were fully human. Artie was an extinct ape. And so was Lucy. So let's get rid of her, shall we? Bye. Were people once apes? Did we evolve from ape-like creatures? No way. We can trust the Bible. And the Bible says that we were created in God's image. We're special. We are not animals. You are a child of God. All right. So what about this guy who was here at the very beginning of our time together? What about him, Mr. Harry? Well, he is clearly pretend, so it's time to say goodbye to Harry. See ya. Okay, so that's all the time that we have together. Remember, my friends, you did not evolve from apes. God made you, and he loves you. You shouldn't say things are true unless you can show the truth of it. But Bisbee here just denied established facts, as if his ignorant opinion overrides demonstrable truth. And he instead asserts baseless, unsupported speculation, as if that was a matter of fact, pretending to know what he cannot show and thus does not know. So none of his claims are truthful. The truth is that even if there was a God, you'd still be an ape.